And I want every person to read it out loud with me. Are you ready? And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Principality means a very strong leadership position. Powers there means miracle working power. The devil has miracle working power. The devil has very strong leadership. He places angels over nations, evil angels. And that's what you see in Daniel. We see a lot of things going on in wars and so on. Did you know if you could see into the spiritual, you would see that this is a spiritual battle? We're not wrestling with flesh and blood. What are we wrestling with? Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. Now, what do we do? We begin to pray and intercede and use the name of Jesus. And I tell you, I looked up here, stri uh, spoil, principalities and powers. And do you know what spoil is? It is a Greek word which means to strip the clothes off from another. Do you know that Jesus stripped the armor off Satan? He stripped him. His principality has been one of his big things, his warfare things. His miracle working power has been one of his big things. And Jesus said, I've stripped him. Now when he gets out of order, you just bind him. He said, you bind him. You bind him. Don't let him do that. That binding is a very, very strong thing. Bind him and he can't do it. Okay? Then I want you to look at another scripture that goes right along with this. <coughs> and I want you to look at Job, not Job, at 1 Chronicles 26, 27. 1 Chronicles 26, 27. So I want us all to look and I want us to go to the Old Testament. Now in the Old Testament, when they began to take spoil, they did something specifically with it. They took it, it belonged to them, but they said a part of it belongs to God because he gave us the victory. 1 Chronicles 26, 27. And they divided their spoil. They did something very specific with it. Okay? Now, look at verse 27. Every person read it out loud. I think it would be good for you to read it out loud. Out of the spoils won in battles did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. Ha, 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 ha. They said, we got all this wealth and all this gold. We won the battle. And so we're dedicating a portion of this for God's house. Now I want you to go back to the Egyptians. We said the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. Correct? The Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. They walked out with their wealth, their gold, their silver, their linen. I mean, if you study anything about Egypt and you see the pictures of all the things in their museums and you go to museums and see the wealth they had, if the Israelites spoiled them, they really had it. Now see, you see that big... Uh, Oh, uh, who is the one that they have show his uh, King Tut, Tutankhamun. They say that that's a small tomb, that he died as a young boy. Said so that's nothing compared to a pharaoh who ruled for years and what he had. Said so we've never unearthed a tomb that was complete of a big name pharaoh. Now if you study and you see what King Tut had, it's absolutely beyond what you can imagine. Uh, you know, they have these uh, gold, uh, oh, what do you call the thing you put the mummy in? What? Sarcophagus. Do you know that they have four layers, I think. My husband would really correct me if he's in here. I'm glad he's not here. I think they have four layers of those things. One fits in another, fits in another, fits in another. And it's all gold, honey. It's heavy gold. Then it has all of this wealth on it. Do you know, even on the mummy's hands, it had like gold thimbles. And all this extreme uh, wealth that was, the body was draped in. Not counting these heavy gold things. Then when you come out of that, then everything that he's going to need in the next life is gold. They even have, I don't know how many beds we saw that he had. It was wood with gold inlay and stone inlay. Then they have one, it looks like a small garage inside of a bigger garage, inside of a bigger garage, inside of a bigger garage. And all of that has gold on it. It has chariots covered with what? Gold. And that's a small one. Now remember, it said the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. I don't think Tut was a drop in the bucket compared to what the, Isra uh, the Israelites took out of there. 
And what did they use it for? Part of it. What did they use it for? To build what? The tabernacle. They built the tabernacle. Where do you think they got all of that linen? They had a drape that went around the whole thing that was pure white linen. Where'd they get it? The Egyptians are famous for linen. They got it from the Egyptians. They knew they'd need it. God knew they'd need a lot of linen for the tabernacle. So probably the Egyptians just gave them bolt after bolt after bolt after linen of linen. Can't you imagine the Israelites saying, what are we going to do with all this linen? It'll clothe us for centuries. Well, it's for the tabernacle. And the wealth of the wicked was laid up for the righteous. Ha, ha, ha. I always think that's funny. I always think that's funny. Okay, now I want you to turn to Hebrews 10, 34. Hebrews 10, 34. In Hebrews 10, 34, God begins to talk to us about the spoiling of ourselves. Paul, and I think it's Paul it's referring to here, there's a lot of discussion about who wrote Hebrews. I think Paul did. Some people think Priscilla did. Oh, she did. She's really going to be in trouble with the Baptist because she's a woman speaking and she had no business doing that, did she? Okay, verse 34. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He said, you just saw that I was in bonds and you spoiled yourself. You robbed of your own finances to give to me, knowing you were laying up treasures in heaven. Where do you need treasures? Do you need treasures in heaven? When you get to heaven, are you going to need some gold? No, the streets are made of gold. What are the treasures in heaven? That's just the banking system. And when you spoil yourself and you begin to give sacrificially, you see what you're doing. You're getting treasures up there. And when you have a need, God says, here it comes. Honey, you've been laying it up here for years. Here it comes back. Only his return is much bigger than a bank here. It's tremendous. So he said, the spoiling of yourselves. Then I want you to look at another one. And this is in the same book, Hebrews 7, 4. So turn to it. Hebrews 7, 4. Abraham. Oh, Abraham. Abraham. He went out and he rescued Lot and his family and all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, grabbed them off, brought them back, and brought all of the wealth back. And he only had, I think, 314 servants. And he was facing like five major armies when he did it. It was a miracle the way he got it. But when he came back, notice him. It says, and I'm reading from Hebrews 7, 4, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the what? Spoils. This is Melchizedek. When Abraham got back, it said Melchizedek came and met him. He was the king of Salem. And it said that Abraham said, see all this wealth I brought back? He said, I'm going to give you 10% of it. And he gave 10% of it. People say, tithing is just the law. Honey, tithing is before the law. Abraham tithed and he's before the law. People say, well, Jesus doesn't teach tithing. Yes, he does. Matthew 23, 23, he teaches tithing. In Hebrews, there is tithing. People say, well, I don't believe we should tithe there. I hear some of the teaching on the radio. That is wrong. This is Bible all the way. It's new, old, all the way through. And now I think this is funny. When the king of Sodom came to Abraham after this, he was so grateful that Abraham had rescued all of them. He said, Abraham... He said, you keep all of the goods, and I will just take the people. And if you remember, Abraham does not take any of that. No, no. He said, the Lord God, the possessor of heaven and earth, he's my source, not you. And he gives all the goods back to the king of Sodom and the people. Do you remember this? It's in Genesis 14. Do you realize the tithe has already been taken out? When the king of Sodom got it back, he got it less 10%. And the 10% went to the priest. Now what is Abraham saying? I don't need that 90%. I just tithed. And when I tithe, I'm laying up wealth in heaven. And God will open the floodgates of heaven when you tithe. He says that. And pour you out blessings that won't stop. So he said, I'll just live on my tithe. You take the 90%. And I think it's funny that that man didn't get 100% back. He only got 90% because Abraham tithed on it before he ever gave it back. Ha ha. 
And Abraham was living on what he knew was promised him from the tithe. No wonder he's called a man of faith. If you are a faithful tither, you should expect to prosper. And if you're not, you ought to go to the lion and take the spoil out of his teeth and say, Stop it! And take the word, you cannot steal from me. I am faithful in it. Now, turn to Isaiah 53, 12. Oh, you know this scripture, but I want you to look at it. And we're going to read it again. Isaiah 53, 12. Oh, we're doing fine on our time today. <coughs> Isaiah 53, 12. See, sometimes I think we're laying down and letting the devil steal from us and we're not taking what belongs to us. Or maybe he isn't just stealing from us. We never knew we had it to start with. You know, he's been stealing, but we didn't know it. And we just let him walk off with things he shouldn't be having. Now, every person read this out loud with me. Everyone. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. Is that true? He stripped their clothes off. The devil's naked. Ha ha. And then he said he divided that spoil. The spoil that the devil took, he divided it with whom? Every Christian? Come on, what does it say? The strong. The strong. How do you get strong in God? By the word, because it's faith that pleases God. So when people begin to grow in the word taking hold of the word, living in the word, what begins to happen to them? They begin to be what? Strong in faith, and they begin to claim that spoil. But people who are weak in faith do not claim the spoil. There is a scripture, I have not understood it, it has bothered me. And it's over there where Jesus is talking. Well, turn to it, it's Matthew eleven twelve. I think I understand it now. Turn to Matthew eleven twelve. I've read this, and I thought, God, what are you saying here? It talks about violence. And I mean, it's really violence in the Greek. It means to get wild. Okay? Verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by what? Force. Do you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to get mean to the devil. You're going to have to say, Hey, stop this. You want me to get violent about it? And you're going to have to stand and violently oppose the devil with the word. It said he divided the spoil with whom? Say it. I want you to say, I'm strong. Because I feed on the Word. And some of you are saying it and you don't do it. So you're calling things that are not as though they are. And you're going to change. I did it on purpose to trap you. You said it, now you're caught. Sneaky, huh? He divides the spoil with people who are strong in faith. See, I used to say, oh God, you just pet uh, Kenneth Copeland. He's your pet. He's just your pet. He's always doing things that I want to do. He's a pet. God said, no, he's not a pet. He's just strong in faith. You get stronger, you can have the same thing. Did you hear the story about Kenneth Copeland and the million dollars? Oh. Some man called him up. This has been several years ago. And he said, I read your book. And I was so encouraged about prosperity. He said that I gave a million dollars to another ministry. He said, God, I need a million dollars for the radio and television. And he said, how come he, that man read my book and gave it to another ministry? And the Lord said, because that other ministry has claimed it for seven and a half years and you've never claimed it. So he got it and you didn't. Oh, now why is it some people get more than others? Why? Come on, tell me why. They claim it. They claim what belongs to them and they get violent about it. They get strong about it. They won't be denied. They don't claim it one day and forget it two weeks later. 
They stand there. And I tell you, when you get strong about it, people think you're just nuts sometimes. Let them think it. When you get the results, they don't think you're nuts. They think it works and encourages their faith too. Let me read you Psalm 68, 12. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home, ha, 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 divided the spoil. Now you say, well, here we are as a church body. And uh, some of the ministry here are out, you know, and they're grabbing off the spoil. They're out in the active part of the ministry. And I'm not. So they're going to get all the spoil. And I'm not. Oh, no. All, every person here who is involved in this ministry, and I'm talking about radio, and I'm talking about the coming television, I'm talking about overseas radio and television. Listen, when they told me they were meeting over there to blanket Europe, I said, God, Life for Layman's going to be in that blanket. We're going to be there. Because I've claimed that for years, four years. Okay, now what about the people who give here? What about the people who intercede here? Are they going to reap the rewards of that as well as those who actively go out and minister? Yes, it says that. Those who stay at home get to divide it equally with those who go out. David said, he set up this a law, and the Bible says it's a law forever. He said, when I go out and fight, the men I leave at home to take care of the, the things here said, get equally the spoil as those who go out and fight. There's equal reception in it. So those of you who give and who pray and intercede, God says your reward is equal to it. There is a dividing that comes about. Isaiah 9.3. Isaiah 9.3. And I want you to turn to it. It says there is a rejoicing in dividing the spoil. Isaiah 9.3 What is it when somebody comes back and gives you a positive report of something that has happened that you prayed about and you gave to and you were not out in the active part but you rejoice with them? What makes you rejoice over that? I remember when I met Charles Capp's older daughter, Beverly. Annette had told me that Beverly was backslidden, had a lot of problems. And I said, I'm going to stand in the gap for Beverly. I didn't know her. I'd never met her. But I put her on a prayer list with young people that were backslidden problems. And I'll never forget, last spring I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a beautiful young girl came up to me and she said, my name is Beverly Capps. And I've just been saved and spirit-filled, and I'm getting ready to go to Ramah. I said, are you who I think you are? Yes. She said, Annette told me to get acquainted with you. Do you think I rejoiced in that? Now, I didn't lead her to the Lord. I didn't pray with her, and she got the baptism. But see, I felt like I had part of the spoil, because I had been interceding for her. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, Isaiah 9, 3. That really excites me when I hear things like that. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy... They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men and rejoice when they divide the spoil. There is a rejoicing when we get it all out here and we get to divide. We see that it comes to all the members of the body that are involved with it. Now turn to Luke 11:22, and then we're going to go to the Old Testament for a story, and then we're going to close, and I'm going to stop on time and not be in trouble. Luke 11:22. Luke. 11. You like this. Read it out loud with me. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcometh him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Now he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So when I come on the devil, am I greater? Are you greater? I want you to say, I'm greater than the devil. Say, he that's in me is greater than the devil. Now it talks about his armor. Talks about his armor. Did you see that? It says, he taketh from him all his armor. Who stripped the clothes off the devil? Jesus did. What scripture is it? Colossians what? Two what? I just want to see if you're awake. 
He stripped his clothes off, and then what does he do? He divides the spoil. All the spoil the devil ever took is to be divided among us because we stand in Jesus. He stripped his armor. We're supposed to have it all. Now, let's see what we do in a battle. You know, you say, well, all this theory is fine, Marilyn, but what about when you're really in it? How do you react? And I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. And I think a lot of people criticize me for teaching the Old Testament. Did you know that? I hear it. There was a pastor in Philadelphia, and he said, that you're an Old Testament teacher. I said, I am not. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I teach both. Because I use new and old and new and old. I think they go back and forth. The Bible says the Old Testament was set for our examples. So I use the stories of the old to bear out the doctrine of the new, to show how it works together. and People can identify the story. He said, Marilyn, why don't you just shut up and admit it? You're an Old Testament teacher. I said, I am not. I'm not going to admit what I'm not. So I haven't seen him for about a year and a half, and he talked to Marlene the other day, and I'm going to be going into his church in 81. He said, tell Marilyn I still believe she's an Old Testament teacher. And when I get there, I'll get him. Okay, Second Chronicles 20. Now, in this chapter, we won't read the whole thing. There are some countries that come against Israel, Moab and Ammon. That would be modern-day Jordan. Edom is involved, too. And uh, it's a very serious time for the nation with all of these people gathering together against Israel. And the king of Israel is Jehoshaphat. And he's a good king. And I want you to look at verse 3. When he heard about this attack coming, see, the devil's coming to steal from him. Try and steal Jerusalem. Try and steal the temple. Try and steal the wealth. Try and steal their peace. It said he was afraid. I guess I like to see in the Bible where other people got afraid too. Because, you know, sometimes when I feel fear rise up, then the devil tries to condemn me over that. I don't think it's a sin to be fearful. I think it's a sin to stay fearful. And I like it where it says he was afraid too. Because I get afraid. Sometimes I think, oh, Jehoshaphat feared. But now watch what he did out of his fear. He set himself to seek the Lord. Now that's setting yourself not to fall apart. Correct? He set himself to seek the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for whom? The whole area. He said, we're going to fast, we're going to seek the Lord. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the city of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. That's good. And they all came in. And they began to pray. And when you read Jehoshaphat's prayer, he prays the word. He said, God, you promised us you'd take care of us. So when the devil attacks you to steal from you, what should you stand on? The word. And you should set yourself to pray. And it is not wrong to ask others to pray with you and to stand with you in faith. Get them. Say, hey, I need you to stand with me. There's nothing wrong with that because some people say, well, then that's weakness. I don't believe that. I believe that's strength where people will unite with you in faith. Then look at verse 12, because he speaks the right thing. His heart may be shaken inside. But verse 12, he said, O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are where? <coughs> On you. So that's good. Well, they have prayed. They have fasted. And God sends a prophet. And the prophet comes into their midst, his name is Jehaziel, and verses 14 through 17, there are two key things I want you to see that he says. They are just outstanding. The end of verse 15 says, For the battle is not yours, but whose? But where does the victory belong? Now wait, who gets the victory? We get the victory, but who gets the battle? God. Then at the 17th verse, he said, uh, Fear not, I'm at the end of the verse, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for who's going to be with you? The Lord will be with you. So Jehoshaphat begins to worship the Lord. They begin to praise the Lord. And the next morning they get up early, and this is verse 20. And uh, they get all of the people together. They get the army, and they get the singers. And of all things, they put the singers in front of the army. Now that doesn't make too much sense. Except the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. So they put the singers out there and Jehoshaphat talks to them because they've got a long way to march and it's a very hot day. 
So he said, now, if we believe God's prophets, he says it in this account, we'll prosper. If we trust in his word, we'll prosper. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for whom? The righteous. Ha ha. They got the spoil. And they came back, and the Bible tells us they stopped at a place called Baraka, which means blessed. When you get the devil's spoil, you're in a blessed place. And it said they went back and they praised the Lord. Is the devil trying to steal from you? Well, honey, if you're afraid, set your face to seek the Lord. Begin to take hold of the word and say, It is written! And get others agreeing with you. And then start praising the Lord and get ready to bring home a whole bundle full of stuff with you. Because you're going to take the spoil from the spoiler. God never set us to be spoiled. He set us to spoil the spoiler. He's been stripped. All right, I want you to hold up something that you feel the devil's been stealing from you. Hold it up right now in your hand as though you're holding it before the Lord. Hold it up. I don't know what it is. It could be your health. It could be a child. It could be your marriage. It could be your finances. It could be your attitudes. It could be a whole lot of things. Right, do you have it up there? All right, now pray after me. Father, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm a victor in Christ Jesus. The devil has no part of me or any of my possessions. Devil, take your hands off in Jesus' name. You're not to spoil me. I'm to spoil you. You came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I bind you in Jesus' name. Now you loose what belongs to me. And I thank you, Father. I rejoice in you, Father, that I have life. I have it in abundances because that's God's promise to me. Amen. Praise the Lord.